In the year 1999, the moon was blasted out of Earth orbit and took a generation of fans on one of science fiction's most iconic journeys. But for all its futuristic style and groundbreaking visuals, one thing never quite added up. How big is this cockpit, really? The outside says one thing. The inside? How could it should be bigger on the inside than the outside? Well, that's another story. Now, on the 50th anniversary of Space 1999, Delimited Productions takes us beyond the inconsistencies to reveal a new, reimagined Eagle interior. One that really fits. Get ready to dock with a future that finally makes sense. If anyone knew the filming set didn't jive with the Eagle model, it was Brian Johnson. Keith Wilson, the production designer, was tasked with creating a space that had to be oversized for filming purposes. <laughs> yep. So the British really do love a good TARDIS. <laughs> The controls we saw in the show had to be cleverly generic and sufficiently ambiguous to support a range of stories and action sequences. Keith Wilson's real skill was designing an interior... Episodic interior. Exactly. DP's true space cockpit for the 50th anniversary is, however, not episodic, and so every instrument and control gadget was informed by a single overall narrative. Still... It's our hope that seasoned fans of the show will recognize that Wilson's spirit is alive and well here. And for the more technical fanatics, DP has laid plenty of Easter eggs to honor the show's original aesthetic. The reality of the situation is that the true interior space is a lot smaller. Yeah, especially with respect to its height and depth. I think fans are probably going to be surprised at how shallow the cockpit space really is. What all of this means is that the surfaces for the flight controls and instruments are also smaller. And not just smaller. In some cases, there are no surfaces to use. Good point. Do you want to give an example of this for the listeners? Well, there's an episode that shows instruments clustered around the windows, but the shape and placement of the windows is not correct to the Eagle model we see in the show. To respect that original 1970s experience in a way that also respects the Eagle model, today's fans could try to scale down, compress, and trim the original cockpit details as needed. But when you look at the recreations over the years, you find a tendency for artists to faithfully recreate the studio set version. So all these sizing inconsistencies persist. Right. And this brings us back to the 50th anniversary tribute. DP opted instead to re-engineer the cockpit space, using the original filming set as an aesthetic template rather than as a ruler. Indeed. DP's 50th anniversary cockpit interior is, quite literally, a fusion of 20th and 21st century solutions. The one individual who can best guide us through this year's rebuild is Antimatter, the artist behind the 50th anniversary True Space Eagle cockpit interior. Let's go. We now turn our attention to the command module of the Eagle Transporter, an icon of science fiction design. But this time, you're not looking at a prop. You're about to enter a fully rebuilt interior, one designed to match the physical space inside the model down to the last inch. As we begin our tour of the reimagined Eagle cockpit, one feature becomes immediately apparent, the presence of the so-called dummy window bulkhead. Originally designed for exterior aesthetics, this lower bulkhead appears as a solid mass from the outside. But its placement imposes a critical design constraint. It consumes the space where, in the series, pilot legs were imagined to go. This rear side of the cockpit is, in many ways, more important than the dash side because of its prevalence in the show. If we want this, then no one is sitting on any floors here. 
The usable cabin volume begins above that bulkhead. This makes the beloved trench-style seating, as seen in the series, physically impossible without violating the outer hull. To solve this, the new interior features elevated seating, positioned just above the dummy window line, allowing realistic legroom without compromising the Eagle's exterior profile. It's a compromise, one rooted not in imagination, but in engineering. Next, we come to one of the most important challenges in this cockpit, visibility. The Eagle's forward windows, though iconic, are both narrow and set high into the outer shell. Even with elevated seating, the pilot's natural sight line offers only a limited forward view, far too narrow for real spacecraft operation. To overcome this, DP has introduced a new central instrument, the Eagle Eye Panoramic Display, situated between the primary viewports. It acts as a digital windshield, reconstructing a wide-angle field of vision, not only simulating what the pilot would expect to see through the forward windows, but also extending beyond them. The Eagle Eye can simultaneously present live feeds, port, starboard, aft, ground view, or even the passenger module interior, allowing the crew to monitor passengers or cargo in transit. It's a solution that bridges form and function, preserving the aesthetic of the original design while addressing what a real pilot would actually need. At the heart of the Eagle cockpit lies a distinctive dual console stack, two independent modules designed with both legacy and innovation in mind. The upper unit, newly designated the Command Data Link, functions as the Eagle's primary tether to Moonbase Alpha. It transmits navigation directives, telemetry, and real-time mission updates, forming a vital bridge between ship and base. While the show imagined a paper readout system, the 50th anniversary rebuild honors that idea with a more plausible twist. A digital card writer and reader, offering pilots tactile confirmation of mission-critical data, a nod to the hard copy concept, but updated for realism. Beneath it sits the Eagle Science Computer, manufactured by our fictional partner, AlphaTech, whose logo is proudly embossed on the front panel. This module expands the Eagle's mission capabilities beyond mere transport, offering a suite of scanning functions tailored for exploration, atmosphere, biology, geology, radiation, and even an enigmatic setting for alien technology. It's the 1970s version of a tricorder. The pilot and co-pilot consoles have also been re-engineered, now with distinct roles. It was often evident in the series that it didn't really matter which seat you were in. DP has designed distinct responsibilities into each crew station, an approach that reflects real-world aerospace practice. Let's break it down into shared systems, complementary controls, and seat-specific operations. Shared systems. Despite their unique roles, pilot and co-pilot share a suite of core systems. Each console retains the show's iconic video phone, now updated with its own camera and microphone. The original show relied on TV magic. Just face the nearest CRT, and somehow you're being seen and heard. Here, we've added some realism. Both consoles also include a solar visor toggle switch, which lets each crew member tint their viewport independently. Front and center, a shared flight display, flanked by the familiar twin thrust sticks, but with a detail the original show never explored. Each stick handle features a thumb button that disengages the yoke linkage, allowing the sticks to move independently. This means the pilot can intentionally unbalance the engines, applying more thrust on one side. Remember, every Eagle engine is off-center, and that imbalance creates a steering torque. It's a crude but effective way to nudge the ship's direction, especially when full RCS control isn't needed. It adds some real-world logic to an otherwise theatrical design. Complementary controls. Each crew member controls a different interior lighting system, with the pilot commanding the overhead white flood and the co-pilot managing the ambient lights. The Eagle's propulsion system is now split by roll. The pilot's console governs the four primary aft engines, critical for forward thrust and orbital maneuvers. Meanwhile, 
the co-pilot manages the ventral lift engines, eight in total, vital for vertical landings and hover modes. Seat-specific operations. As command lead, the pilot station includes controls for flight mode selection, two pilots, solo or full autopilot, along with the attitude control system for pitch, yaw and roll. The Eagle Eye's second camera is also controlled from this position, essential for situational awareness. To honor the original hardware, legacy labels such as shield modulator and vacuum chamber remain, their purpose open to interpretation, but part of the Eagle's mysterious charm. The co-pilot, managing lift systems, also controls landing gear deployment and the newly introduced podlock mechanism a hydraulic clamping system that secures the passenger module to the spine. Where once the pod seemed to magically stay put, it now rests on real-world engineering. Thus, the co-pilot station now includes dedicated podlock indicators, giving real-time status during module transitions, a change born of necessity and long overdue. And yes, the laser control remains. In a nod to series canon, the beam modulation cluster allows for selectable laser colors, preserving that signature Space 1999 energy with a new twist of logic. The settings shown here explain the cyan-tinted laser used in DP's recent animation videos. But what happens in solo pilot mode? Enter the auxiliary control interface. It's a compact panel mounted on top of the pilot console. Using a scroll and select system, the pilot can access and affect essential co-pilot functions, like raising the landing gear, triggering a scent thrust, or firing the laser, all without having to leave his or her seat. Let's now look at other additions that didn't exist in 1975, but feel right at home in this world. One of the most significant upgrades begins outside the cockpit, where formerly nondescript detailing has been replaced with functional solar arrays mounted atop the Eagle's two junction modules. Inside the cockpit, this addition is reflected in the pilot's attitude control system, where a new mode switch, labeled APV for auto photovoltaic, hands over roll control to the Eagle's flight computer. When engaged, the ship adjusts its attitude to optimize solar collection, maximizing energy exposure relative to the nearest star. A companion display on the upper dash shows the PV status off, on, or auto, alongside a sun sensor and four glowing panel indicators. Brightness changes in real time based on incident photon flux. To further safeguard ship and crew, reserve battery health is shown through 12 indicators, six cells per side. Each column is labeled in the show's distinctive countdown font. Small details, but critical in an emergency. Blue means good. Red means a fault or failure. This system is linked to DP's new battery detailing on the two junction modules. There wasn't much real estate left on that part of the dash, so it made for a practical and aesthetic way to fill the space. And finally, a rethinking of the escape system. There's an episode establishing a hatch beneath the cockpit floor. A nice idea, but impractical given how difficult it would be to kneel there and how little space must remain below. So DP proposed a forward-facing emergency egress system instead. Just below the central console, there's now a storage locker, and behind it, a sealed crawlway that leads toward the nose of the eagle, keeping the fantasy but grounded in plausible design. These features represent more than just added detail. They reflect an evolution from television fantasy to physical plausibility. And now, after half a century, the cockpit of the Eagle Transporter finally makes sense. Happy 50th anniversary to Space 1999. I think they can work. Last year, the seat design was very different. They were still elevated and motorized, but far more compact. The idea was to use motorized leg lifts to help the pilots ease into the legroom cavities. But this year I began questioning if those seats were unnecessarily too different from the show. This design is more consistent with the original seats and I did pay attention to clearance when developing the new consoles. 
These seats have exactly the same range of motion as my earlier build, but they do require the pilots to set down and swing their legs into place. The stowable RCS control was an important 11th hour addition. Brian Johnson's thruster detailing went largely ignored in the show because they weren't piped into the filming model's Freon canisters. So Keith Wilson didn't really have reason to include some kind of NASA joystick, but I felt it was a cockpit detail that finally needed to make an appearance. <laughs> 